We're going to be in chapter 20, and the title of the study is Abraham's Failures, Failure and God's Grace. As we look at chapter 20, we're coming back into the main tension of Abraham's life, and really the book of Genesis is, is will a woman have a son that will be that seed that will crush? Now we know that, Ab- that Isaac, who eventually their son will come, uh, will be named, is not the Messiah, but he is in the lineage of the Messiah. See, back in Genesis, God created the earth. It was a perfect environment. Man was in perfect relationship with one another, with the environment, and with God. It was a beautiful scene. It was perfect. What we see today, in all regards, is in a fallen state. And that's a result of the sin of Adam and Eve. God said that they should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Because in the day that they do that, they would surely die. And death did enter physically. It was introduced, something that God did not want mankind to experience in the sickness and the disease. But also, creation began to die. And the relationship between them and the Lord now experienced death as as well. They were separated from the Lord. But the Lord gave a promise. And he said that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, Satan, who had deceived Adam and Eve in their sin. It was a promise of salvation. Now, I mean, when you read it in Genesis, it's, it's very, I mean, it's not an expanded thought. You just know that there's going to be a defeating of Satan, and therefore all that he was worth, and all that he tried to do. And, of course, it is fulfilled ultimately in Jesus. So whenever you read of that promise, we get to backfill it with, you know, the, the fulfillment of the Messiah coming. And so it was a promise of salvation. It was a promise of restoration. It was a promise of defeat. as something they hung on to dearly. And we see the tension as we go through the book of Genesis. Uh, uh, Abel kills, is killed by uh, Cain. Um, they, so now there's no son. And then Seth comes along. But then everything gets corrupted in the world. And there's one righteous man by the name of Noah. The world is wiped out, but now the promise uh, comes through him all the way down to a man by the name of Abraham. But there's a problem with Abraham. He and his wife are older and they have no children and have never been able to have children. And so we're following this tension and yet the promises of God saying, you're going to be a great nation. You're going to have more descendants than the stars of the heaven and there is no child. And so we see points where Abraham and Sarah get involved and they try and fix the issue. They, they say, well, just take Eleazar, our servant. Let him, you know, you see him, let him be the one. The Lord's like, it's not Eleazar. And so they travel down to Egypt because of a, a time of need and famine. They get down there. We're going to see this repeated. Abraham tells Sarah, don't tell him you're my, my husband or my wife, that I'm your husband. She gets taken into the harem of of Pharaoh, which if you're reading the story and you know she's the woman that's going to produce the child, crisis, the tension in the moment. We don't read it with tension because we know how the story ends. But if you're reading it, you're fine. It's like, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Mankind, you know, everything is about to be lost. But the Lord steps in and warns Pharaoh and delivers them and they come back with many belongings out of Egypt. And then they take Hagar, and they try to ha- have her have a child, and she does, Ishmael, and he'll be the one. The Lord's like, that's not the one. And now we come into this next scene where that same kind of tension is oh, in, 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 right in front of us, and we're going to see the Lord once again provide. Satan is trying to thwart the work of God to save mankind, and that's what chapter 20 is talking about um, and, of course, we get to see the moving parts of the scene. But let's pick up at verses 1 and 2 where we're introduced to Abraham's lack of faith to protect Sarah. And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. That would be the land of the Philistines. Now Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, of his wife, She is my sister, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Abraham. Now we'll get into the actual story in just a moment, but I want to just pay attention to this idea that Abraham is journeying about. He's dwelt in different places throughout the promised land. He's he's a 
nomadic. He takes care of uh, livestock. He spent a lot of time recently in Hebron. But for whatever reason that is not stated, he moves towards, uh, down in the south, towards Gerar. And that's where he is. But when he goes in, he, he obviously, is, he's going to make a mistake. But that literal journeying about that he did contrasted with Lot's becoming a dweller inside the city. It produces a metaphor. I mean, don't go off and begin to talk about the evils of city dwelling versus, you know, country living, okay? That's not what you're supposed to do. But the metaphor is there, right, for, our, for us to take up spiritually. And we don't have to wonder about it. First Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners, as pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Our home is not this earth. It is, you know, I have a passport. It's a U.S. passport. And I am called a citizen of the United States, but that's just, that's like kids play compared to where my real passport is. It's in heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven. And this life that I'm living right now, however many years I'll be given to live this life, I hope the Lord comes back I get to experience the rapture. That's what I'm hoping for. But the Lord knows how, when that day is going to be. None of us do. And, and whatever it is, in the years that I have to serve the Lord, I want to make certain that I don't get bogged down and living like this is the place for me. This is the, I'm thinking of the Green Acres right now. I didn't even intend to say that. But, this, you know, farm living, right? No. Just that I would live for him. And that I would be pleasing to him. I wouldn't be wrapped up in the systems of this world or in the cares of this world or living for some accomplishment or living for whatever I've established. We are to be those that are sojourners and pilgrims. Do you think of yourself as this way? Because you should. We are to think of ourselves as just passing through. Well, what's the difference between being a sojourner that's saying I'm just passing through versus a person who says, this is my home. Well, you start to focus on the wrong things. You begin to live for that which seems permanent and forever. And so when you travel, um, you know, you pack your bags and you go. Um, some of you, um, how many of you overpack when you go? Okay, how many of you take great pride in the fact that you do not overpack? Is anybody? Okay, I'm one of those weird people. I, I don't want to overpack. I mean, I feel defeated if I come home and I haven't worn one of the shirts in my suitcase. I was like, what a waste, you know? So I try to really get it down to as few things as possible. Um, I travel, I've traveled a lot with my dad um, doing missions work and, and other types of travel and with my brother-in-law. And um, they bring everything. They bring everything. So when I know I'm traveling with them, Rebecca will usually say, well, what about, you, you know, shampoo and toothpaste? I'm like, no, nah, they'll have it. And so I get there, I go, do you have any, ch-? and I'll start asking, like, well, didn't you bring your own? I'm like, no. I go, well, what were you going to do? I said, I know you pack too much, so I'm just going to use your stuff. Because <laughs> I don't want to pack. I don't want to overpack. I'm just passing through. And um, that is the same idea behind camping, right? Let's go camping. Well, you don't take everything. You just take enough to get you through the weekend or however long your camping trip is. Um, especially, I've been a lot of years since I've done it, but like backpacking, four or five day backpacking trips. I mean, listen, you, you can pack too much, but you're not going to go far. And you're going you're gonna to figure out what to shed real fast. And it's like, this isn't forever. We're just, it's just, we're having fun, Right. But that's the spiritual attitude we should have as we move through this world. Let me read to you this quote from Albert Barnes. I think beautifully illustrates this. He says, We should not encumber ourselves with much of this world's goods. Many professed Christians get so many worldly things around them that it is impossible for them to make a journey to heaven. They burden themselves as no traveler would. And they make no progress. A traveler takes along as few things as possible, and a staff is often all that a pilgrim has. We make the most rapid progress in our journey to our final home when we are least encumbered with the things of this world. It might be lawful, but is it profitable? 
You might be okay to do it, but is it, is it slowing you down? Is it keeping you from being focused? If I was to give a hypothetical here today, I know many of you get excited, and some of you are going to resist this hypothetical scenario for your life the whole way through the illustration. Just, just relax for a second. That's all I can say. Just relax. Let's say that right now the Lord calls you and your family to be full-time missionaries, and you're going to be leaving next week to go. Is there anything that immediately jumps into your mind so I could never do that because of my family? I could never do that because I've got this business. I've worked too hard for this business or my education or I have some accomplishments I'm about to, to, to receive. You know, Jim Elliott, when he was getting ready to go over and be a missionary to the Aki Indians, was told, you know, Jim, you have so much ahead of you and you're going to be giving up so much to go and do this. Are you sure this is what you should be doing? He says, no man is a fool to give up that which he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. And, and this mentality of being a sojourner, he had it. But if you're still in this illustration, you're like, there's no way I could ever do that. I love my family too much. So then the Garys who went overseas for 11 years didn't love their family? You love their family more than them? I think it's I mean, it what an incredibly arrogant thing to say. What about the Hemians that are over there in, in, in Costa Rica right now or many other missionaries around the world? You don't love them, your family, more than they love their family. It's just that maybe they love Jesus more. Jesus said, if you're not willing to forsake all your family, you are not worthy of me. What is it that would say, in your mind, it's like, I just couldn't go because of that. That may be the thing that the Lord wants to deal with you on, to begin to loosen your grip upon it. Well, that's my identity. That's my thing. That's what I do. That's what my family's always done. You're a Christian. That's your identity. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. You are a slave to whatever King Jesus says he wants to use you for. And so our response should be like Abraham that we're going to get to in a couple of weeks is, speak, Lord, your servant listens. There's a story I read many years ago. I don't know the missionaries' names. I think they were going to the Philippines. But the, the story was like this. They had planned. They had finally got all their support. They headed overseas. And before they left, though, they were packing their station wagon full of everything they possibly could from the back to the top all the way to the front, just enough for one person to drive. And they loaded it on a cargo ship, and um, they made their way over there, and they waited. And they were dreaming about the day when the station wagon would get there, and all of their belongings would be there, and they'd be able to have this, and they'd be able to have that. And they're just, it's like they found themselves, as they relate the story, is that's what they were thinking about all the time. They were just thinking about all that stuff that they were going to be able to have. Well, the day finally came, and they went to the port city, it cleared customs, they got in the, the, the vehicle, they started it up, and they began to head home. And they thought, you know, before we go back out to the villages where they lived, let's just get a bite to eat in the big city. So they did that. They came back to the station wagon, except that the station wagon was not there. As they relate the story, they say, you know, what God taught us was we were hoping so much for everything that was in that station wagon. And we are hardly focusing upon the mission in front of us. It was just about all that stuff. And the Lord taught us, they said, the Lord taught us in that season that we had too tight of a grip to the world's belongings and the Lord just loosened our grip a little bit. That's a great attitude to have, isn't it? But maybe that's what needs to happen today is the Lord wants to loosen your grip on that which you say identifies you that's outside of the kingdom, or some accomplishments, or all those things that we mentioned. Well, Abraham is making his way into the city. He talks to Sarah, don't tell me you're my, my wife, tell me you're my sister, which we'll see that that's half true, which is a full lie, but it's, it's half true in one sense. She is a half-sister. And um, so they're making their ways. Now, 25 years earlier, down in Egypt, the same thing happened. And Pharaoh took her in to his harem. You would think that would have been enough with that dumb idea. But that's not the case. He still is on that idea, and that is the plan. It's a lapse of faith that he has, and it gets Sarah into all kinds of trouble. Isn't it amazing 
that we can fall for the same thing over and over again? I read in one commentary, and I said, this is not an account of, uh, you know, the city of Gerard. This is the writer just rehashing the same story but putting different elements into it because no man would make such a serious mistake twice. (laughs) I'm like, you don't know humanity. You don't know Troy Warner because I guarantee you I've made the same mistake twice. Which of us haven't made the same mistake twice? And if you would say yourself, well, you just made the same mistake at least twice because you think too highly of yourself. We all fall, and he falls to the same thing. But this is not just a simple fear factor that he has because of uh, maybe what he heard happened in uh, Sodom with those angels coming to town and the, them wanting to get abused. He has that kind of fear in his mind. Satan is at work to thwart the work of God. It is interesting. I know this has had to cross some of your mind as you think about this. It's like, who, why would somebody want to take Sarah into their harem? Because if you've been following along, she's 89 years old. If you're 89 years old, no disrespect, but that's not usually who you have kings are looking for. They're usually looking for the 19-year-old, right? Somebody young, but she comes in and she was still very beautiful and um, turned the heads of people in the village. And Abraham anticipated this. She lived to be 127, which would have meant she probably was by, if you were to put it into our age bracket, maybe in her late 40s, 50s. Um, but it wasn't just a physical thing that probably was going on here. It would have been something else, and that is her brother, husband, Abraham, is a very rich man, and he has a lot of belongings, and he has a lot of servants, and so he would have been viewed as kind of like a prince with all of that stuff that he had. And so maybe it was the lustful desires to bring another woman into uh, his harem, but it also would have been a status thing of bringing somebody in who was so well-known for their wealth that would have built him up as well. So probably you have a couple of motivations going on. But this is the plan. Look at verses 3 through 7. But God came to Abimelech in a dream. And they, and by the way, Abimelech, is, is just, it does, it's not a, his name. It's just a title of king. Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man. Because of the woman whom you've taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, that would be sexually, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. And the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know know that you shall surely die, and all who are yours. So the Lord is protecting Um, Sarah again. Because if she's brought into this harem and he's having sex with her, uh, what does that do to the promise? What happens if, you know, they leave the town and somehow he escapes and now he leaves, but, but she's pregnant with child? I mean, is Isaac Abimelech's child or is it Abraham's child? You see the problem and the, the tension that's building in the story? Because Satan wants to do whatever he can to stop the coming of the Messiah. It is interesting that the Lord still refers to Abraham, or actually it's the first mention of it in Scripture, as a prophet. Now, Enoch prophesied and Noah prophesied, but this is the first mention of that word prophet. And he says, Abraham is a prophet. He speaks forth my word. What was the word that Abraham had to speak forth? Well, he had the gospel to speak forth. He didn't have it in his totality of Jesus born in Bethlehem and died on the cross and three days later rose from the dead, but he had the good news that had come out of the garden that a Messiah was coming. And so rather than allowing fear to have gripped his heart, he should have come in, come into the town and did what he did in in Hebron. 
He should have began to build an altar. He should have began to worship the Lord. And as they came and inquired about this beautiful woman with them, say, oh no, let me tell you about her. She is the one that's going to bear a child. She's going to have this seed that has been promised back in the garden. Now, whether they thought that he would be the Messiah or not, we are not told. They're getting little bits of information as the revelation comes. But he had enough to talk about the special woman that she was and the special work that God was about to do and how God had spoke to him. He could have prophesied about that all day long, but he didn't. And fear got him. And isn't that pretty much what happens to us when we talk about sharing the good news? Fear gets us. We're afraid of how they're going to respond, that they're going to get mad, what they're going to think of us. Maybe we'll lose our job or maybe we won't be welcome in that group anymore. And we've worked too hard to get to this place. And we have fear that keeps us from proclaiming the gospel, the good news. Except we get to tell the whole story, the death, burial, and resurrection, and the second coming of Christ. So let that be a challenge and an exhortation to you to not be silent, but to speak. Because, you know, when you become silent about your faith, man, snares begin to be set all around you. Do the people you spend time with, do they know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? Do they know you as a prophet? I mean, this is what Paul said, that he wished that we would all prophesy, right? That we would all speak forth the word of the Lord. We all are ambassadors. We all have been given this, this privilege, this treasure of the gospel message hidden in these earthen vessels. We all have the privilege to be the vessel by which God pleads through to humanity, be reconciled to God. And so we must walk that out. But he doesn't do that. I'm sure when the Lord said to Abimelech, he's a prophet, he probably thought, lousy prophet. I mean, what's wrong with you? This is your guy? And, and yet God is not going to cast him away, is he? To use the word of our day, God's not going to cancel him. And that is such a popular thing to do. Let, let me be very, very clear. We are a redemption culture, not a cancel culture. And if we walk long enough with each other, we're going to see each other fail, right? We're going we're gonna to see one another miss the mark and have a bad day or say the wrong thing or fall into some way. What do you want to happen to you when that takes place? And here's the thing. You know, if you follow the cancel culture out, you're going to cancel every single one of the heroes of Scripture because at some point in time, they failed. And the thing about Scripture is that that lays out their failure wide open. And this is a failure of Abraham taking care of his own skin, not regarding his wife, acting as a coward, and not having faith that God was able to deliver. It's a massive failure that he enters into. Do you want to cancel him? No, not cancel. He's going to be redeemed. We are a part of a grace culture. And that we have been called to walk in this same kind of grace and this same kind of mercy with each other. And actually what Lord, the Lord says is, and if you don't show mercy, don't look for mercy. So while I would imagine you would not be a part of that kind of thinking, Here's the reality. We live in a culture, and if we are not careful, we can become impacted by that culture in little ways we don't even know. And maybe, maybe I don't know, maybe you need to look around. Maybe you've been really a lot harder on people than you've ever been before, just tearing into them. And I would just ask you, is that the Lord, way the Lord deals with you? Or does he still call you son, daughter, servant, prophet, prophetess. And if that is the case, and it is the case, then let's make certain that when we're around people that are failing, that we actually take the time to minister the grace of God and let them know that God is not done with them. Praise the Lord for God's grace. So <laughs> Abimelech, though, man, he is, he's pleading his innocence in this. And on the issue of Sarah and taking her, not knowing that it was Abraham's wife, um, he is innocent. <laughs> but he's not that innocent. And um, 
Just think, let's, let's read verses 8 through 10, we'll pick this up. So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all his servants, and told all these things in their hearing. And the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you have in view? That you've done these things. And you can almost hear the Lord saying, what was your plan, Abraham? I told you that she was going to have a child by you. What were you thinking? What's your end game? It's a rebuke by Abimelech. It's like a two-edged sword. Abimelech's got his own issue. But in this question, you can hear the Lord asking, what was your end game, Abraham? How are you going to work this one out? And of course, the Lord intervenes and, and rescues him. And so he's, he's saying, I'm, you've done it against me. I'm innocent. I'm free. You are the guilty one. And, and that is true. But l- let's just pause for a, a second. This is a guy that has a harem, okay? And when, when kings that were powerful wanted to have people in their harem, he didn't ask. He took them. They're mine. So this is a lustful man that's using a tradition or a law or part of their culture to justify his innocence. He knows that he's innocent as it relates to this issue with Sarah. And he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm free of this. And the Lord's like, yeah, you didn't know that. But there are still other issues in his life. So it's not like he's completely free and guilt-free here. He's got a harem. That's not the way God designed it. God designed that the the two, man and woman, would become what? One flesh. Not the the three or the ten or the Solomon, you know, the thousand. I mean, that's not what God's plan was. So Abimelech, although he's innocent in this one issue, he still has a sin issue. And he may feel justified in his actions, and the culture maybe would uh, justify it, and maybe even people in the kingdom love to see the king get another woman in his harem and make alliances because this speaks of, of power of their, of their nation. All selfishly motivated. I guarantee you the women being taken didn't feel that way. But you know, there is a similarity, and, and I'll just read to you from John Phillips. He says, after all, human laws can be very accommodating. Had Abimelech broken the law? No. And why? For the simple reason the law was so written that his lust could be accommodated. The same spirit is evident today. There was a time when adultery was a crime and no more. We have written laws. There was a time when homosexuality was a crime. Not anymore. And it continues. You see, just because the culture approves of it, and makes it okay, does not make you innocent before the Lord. He was innocent on this one issue, but he still had a sin problem. He still had an issue to deal with. It's not the focus of the passage, but let me just say this. All of us have a sin issue. And in reality, can't it be said of all of us before coming to Christ, you're a dead man? You're a dead woman. You've sinned against a holy God, and that sin has put you in a place where there's enmity enmity between you and the Lord, and the soul that sins will surely die. And so there exists that negative, that dangerous situation, but God sent his son to hang upon the cross that he took our punishment, and he died for us. Jesus became the dead man for Troy and for you. And as I put my faith and trust in him, I am forgiven of my sins, and I become a man who is now justified in the sight of God. And maybe you're here today, and you are only here because your wife or your husband or your kids or a friend or a neighbor, you lost a bet, and you have to go to church, and that's why you're here. We're glad you're here. But as we're going through this, all of a sudden, you're hearing these songs, and you're hearing the scriptures being read, and now you're beginning to feel something happen within you, and you're beginning to grow uncomfortable in your own sin and you realize there's separation between you and God listen don't mistake that conviction that uneasiness that is coming over you now as God pushing you away it is actually God drawing you to himself because anybody who has ever come to God has first become uneasy with their state and there might be things you're like well I can justify everything I do well okay maybe in the culture but what about before God Before the Lord, you need to get right with him. And he has provided the way. 
And what the whole story is about is in the seed, Jesus. He died on the cross for you. Obviously, they don't know everything we know, but we can stand back and look and draw and make application to ourselves. So Abimelech confronts Abraham, and um, he had every right to do this. And we see the response of Abraham, verses 11 through 13. And Abraham said, Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place. And they will kill me on account of my wife. So, oh, you're married? Well, we won't commit adultery, but we will commit murder. So they'll murder him. Now they could take Sarah. That's what he's afraid of. Um, so they had, again, an interesting um, way in getting around things that were um, socially unacceptable to fulfill their lust. No different than today. Verse 12, but indeed, she truly is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house. It's like, is there an accusation? Does it, this, it, it, there's just a little hint of the garden blame going on here, isn't there? It's the woman you gave me. It's the serpent. When God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said to her, this is your kind. This is, this is a line. You circle this next, you know, uh, end of the sentence. This is called manipulation. He's saying it to Sarah. This is your kindness that you should do for me. In every place, wherever we go, say of me, he is my brother. You want me to lie? You want me to say I'm your brother and not your wife? Yeah, because I don't want to die. Yeah, but what if I get taken into harems? I don't know about that part. It is him looking out for his own self-interest and motivated by fear. When fear is overcoming us and we're motivated by self-interest, people always get hurt that are close to us because we make bad, sinful decisions. We are a people of faith, not a people of fear. Abraham had every reason to have faith here. What has he seen God do so far? I mean, he has these encounters with God and has sit-down meals with them and prepares a meal. And I mean, he's not a coward. I mean, when he finds out that Lot and his family's been taken you know, captive by that coalition of eastern kings, he gets his household servants, he forms an army, goes after them, fights with them, and takes them back and delivers everybody safe and sound. He's not a coward. I mean, when, when God said he's going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, he goes toe to toe with God. Well, don't destroy them. You know, what if there's, you know, 40, 50? You know, what if there's 10? Don't. I mean, he, he doesn't seem to be bashful then. And so that which seems to be a strength is his boldness and his faith. He had a warrior spirit. Suddenly, that's where he trips and that's where he falls again. Interestingly enough, in Genesis 26, his son Isaac is into the same exact thing as what his dad did. Anytime we make our decisions from fear, we are susceptible to error. It's not that we don't ever deal with fear. Of course we deal with fear. Things happen. We get worried about scenarios and outcomes, and it can cause fear in our life. But when you allow that fear to begin or be the way in which you make your decisions, and it causes you to be disobedient to the Lord or begins to cause you to step outside of the Lord, that's where we got to just draw back and have faith that God is going to see us through. The half-truth about his relationship with Sarah, and that's kind of an uneasy topic, right? His sister? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Abraham married his sister? Well, in Leviticus 18 is the first time we find mention of that kind of relationship being forbidden. Leviticus 18, 20, Deuteronomy 27, marrying your sister becomes something that is illegal. Up until this point in time, it was not a law that for, well, caused a families to not do that, and it was a common practice. So very odd to us, but not to Abraham and his day, and not a sinful act it would be today after the law was given. So Abimelech's going to respond um, to him in verses 14 through 16 to the Lord and, and return Sarah. We read, Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah, to his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. 
Dwell where it pleases you. I mean, this guy is, I mean, of course, God threatened his life, right? But, I mean, he's really going out of his way to make certain that everything is going to be right. Um, Pharaoh demanded that he leaves, but Abimelech says, you can stay here. Verse 16, then, to Sarah he said, behold, I have given your brother, I mean, can you, you got to hear the attitude and the wink. I gave your brother a thousand pieces of silver, 25 pounds of silver, is what they estimate this to be. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus, she was rebuked. King James says rebuked. Um, newer translation, I think, much better and it's translation of vindicated. That's what's trying to be done here. How much is a thousand shekels, 25 pounds of silver? Well, a Babylonian laborer would have had to have worked making a half a shekel per month for 167 years to, to get this amount of money. That's a nice nest egg, don't you think? Why is this happening? I mean, God didn't say that. He just said, send her back. <laughs> Abimelech is not taking any chances. And so this is an attempt to not only send her back, but also show that he was not having ill will towards them. And so he gives them a ton of money. This is also called the grace of God. He has just failed again, doing the same exact thing, and God blesses him even in that failure. Now, if you hear that and you think, oh, then I guess I need to go fail. Honey, we're going to Gerard. No, 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 no. That's not the solution. Because when you see the grace of God, what, what happens in a follower of Christ's heart is, I don't ever want to sin again. You're so kind. You're so good. You're so generous. I don't want to offend you more. I mean, that you would forgive me. And our hearts are drawn towards the Lord in obedience. You've heard me say this for some of you for 26 years. And I'm going to keep saying because I believe it's true. If you hear that God is gracious towards the sinner and that you think that now you're going to go and sin, it is clear evidence that you know nothing about the grace of God. And that God has not touched your heart because that is not what takes place in a believer's life. When goodness comes, it's his goodness that leads us to what? Repentance. Not disobedience. And so the Lord is showing grace. And again, I just want to remind you that maybe you're walking into church here and you're coming out of a, a great failure again a second time. And you're thinking, God wants nothing to do with me. No, he's still calling you son. And he's still calling you daughter. And he's willing to be gracious to you. And he's willing to restore. Well, I don't deserve it. Yeah, that's the whole point. I mean, we don't deserve grace. You can't earn grace. If you earn it, then it's called a reward. This is unmerited favor. You're getting, a great, you're getting something that you don't deserve as a blessing in your life. You've earned something else, but instead you're getting grace. Not judgment. Not a reward. And this is still available to you. We close here, look at verses 17 and 18, with Abraham praying for Abimelech. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants, and they bore children. For the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So they had been in this circumstance long enough to have the awareness that people weren't getting pregnant, but God had already told them within the year they're going to have a child. So you got about a 90-day window here that this could have taken place um, just because of the length of a you know, pregnancy. I, you know, this would have been a really awkward prayer for Abraham, I would think. You got to pray a blessing upon this man who's suffering because of your sin, and because of your lack of faith. But, but he does it, and, and the Lord shows to Abimelech, I am the true and living God. If, he, if, if Abimelech wanted to ha know who the true and living God was through an interesting failure of a follower of God, he just found out. And isn't that the Lord, though? That even when something is kind of, you know, the, the, 
the short end of kindness and respect and all the rest, God still can speak and show grace to the sinner. And he, and he is a sinner that needs to repent. So we don't know what happened to him, but he had it right in front of him to be able to do everything he needed to do. So chapter 18 is a way of saying that this is Abraham's child that's about to come uh, here in the next chapter. This is his child, and it's not Abimelech's child. And God was faithful, and God is delivering. So many lessons here. We talked about God's ways not being thwarted. Hey, the Lord is going to build his church, and he's going to come back at a time that he wants. And nobody's going to get in the way of that. We need to have faith in what God has called us to do and how to live and not live by fear. If you're making decisions by fear, stop and get your eyes on the Lord and make decisions from faith. And just because the culture may approve and laws may say it's okay, that doesn't mean it's all right with the Lord. We allow his word and his ways and his revelation to lead us and guide us. We are to live as sojourners and God's grace abounds to us this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you show grace. Thank you that, Lord, even when we are followers and we are people of faith like Abraham and we fail, that even still you are there to show grace again. We, Lord, see so clearly we do need to live as people that are just passing through and not getting all caught up in the the affairs of this world. Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts and that we would see the great reward of being identified as your disciple and your servant and giving our life away for the the cause of the gospel. Lord, help us with our fear. If we are not preaching and not sharing the gospel because we're afraid, Lord, I pray you would fill us with your spirit and give us boldness to speak boldly as we ought.